people, what's up? Welcome back to Super Throwback to the Classics, the cinematic movie podcast that takes you back to the iconic films of 20 years ago and beyond on the big three. Oh, no, not in the big three anymore. We added another one to it. Now it's big four. Uh, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and now Pandora. I'm your guy, Jan Alonso. With me, of course, is... Danger Neff, the, uh, the uh, critically acclaimed Danger Neff, the... Uh... Uh, impossible danger, Neff. I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like after last episode, uh, a lot of people ain't on my side anymore. The harsh critic, danger, Neff. The harsh critic, danger, Neff. Harsh critic, well, danger. I'm, I'm good with that because I know movies I like. This that movie just didn't happen to be one of them. Mind you, you and I have reviewed clunkers before. But then we've also reviewed Hidden Gems. And I felt like that was one of those that kind of, I, I, I guess I was more excited for it than what the end product wound up being. You know what I mean? That's kind of mm-hmm. Anyways. Uh, yeah. How are you, partner? I'm good, bro. Um, kind of just hanging in there. Uh, we're watching our, our Lakers get beat to shit right now, which is, I guess you could say kind of expected, but at the same time, you know, there's still lead to – one, but you know we'll, we'll take this loss today. We'll definitely uh, uh, come back around for the next game for sure. Uh, besides that, though, man, uh, it's been a rel- relatively easy week. What's up with you? Way I look at it with the Lakers is simple. You got to make sure. Look, they can win one, and that's fine. But at some point, the Nuggets' magic has to run out. At some point. You know, it's kind of like the Dallas Stars in hockey right now. So, if they win this one, cool, whatever. But you got to come out strong on game four, and you got to make sure you close out this series. Yeah, yeah. The, so the Nuggets caught a fire with this game, for sure. But, you know, by the time this show comes out, with next game four is what, Thursday? It should be Thursday. So, we'll have a better idea of where we're at. And then – uh Come, uh, you know, next time you you guys see us, uh, we'll we'll be in the NBA Finals. Damn right. Damn yeah. skippy. Damn right. Um, How was your week? Uh, I'm good. You know, I'm same old, same old. Working at home this uh, this week, um, which is always nice. So yeah, I'm solid. Um, not a lot of moving news to cover. The only thing that dropped really was uh, uh, WandaVision, which. Yep. Uh, Marvel TV is, uh, or I'm sorry, Disney finally dropped the the preview of uh, of WandaVision, which was always going to be the more interesting, not interesting, but the weird, weird TV show that that people were kind of curious on exactly where this is going to go. And uh, I'll give my thoughts real quick. Um, obviously, I knew the romp of it. First of all, aesthetically, it's beautiful. Like, I love it going back to that old 1950s kind of color pan, but it's an updated graphic sort of, so you're you're good with that. Um, I also like the very, very, very small little look at Vision with the original, like his original armor that I know him for, which is the red face the yellow neck and then the green body, mm. uh, which is uh, really cool. Um, this is clearly kind of following more into somebody said that they're retconning Scarlet Witch's powers, and I, it's not that. It's that Scarlet Witch's powers just hadn't been fully explored, right? Um, this is clearly following a comic known as House of M, which mm-hmm. was initially a huge X Men comic. Um, and not even an old one. This this thing is only. I think that comic is less than maybe le- less than fifteen years now. Um, and it, what it did was it kind of it gave the ability to to basically undo a lot of bad stuff that the X Men did at the time, mm-hmm. and it turned into kind of this huge thing afterwards. So. I think it clearly sets up a, a, a interesting direction where uh, where the TV shows are going to go and how they finally tie into the movies. Because that was always one thing that I just I wasn't happy about with uh, uh, with the Marvel TV shows 
and then this. It's like, okay, Marvel TV. Okay, but they're really separated from the MCU. So it's like, I'm not going to get Daredevil or Luke Cage, you know, in, uh, in Marvel. I now have to wait for them to officially introduce them into the MCU. Um, at, the same to- at the same token, you know, you had S.H.I.E.L.D., right? Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And that was like an eight-season run, nine-season run. And it's like, okay, yeah, we're, we're, we're bringing back this person. But you know what? Uh, it, it, the the storyline's too complicated. We're not going to really say that they're back in the Avengers and whatnot. And it's like, okay, like, I, I get it, but I don't get it, but I get it. You know what I mean? I mean, <clears throat> what I gathered from the trailer, um, I knew it was going to be weird. I, I, I felt in my bones it was going to be, like, the most oddest shit ever. And also gathered the fact that... Um, it's really the story itself is based off of Wanda, Scarlet Witch. And, you know, and what, what gives it away was that line was when she asked Vision, am I dead? And he goes, no, I would just say that because you're dead. So clearly this takes place after uh, Infinity War or after, after Infinity War, likely after Endgame, right? So it would appear that her psych level is kind of gone awry, if you will. You know what I'm saying? Which again, they kind of they kind of gave a wink to that idea back in back when we first were introduced to the twins. You know, when at the very end of was it uh, Civil War? I think it was Civil War. Civil War. Yeah. Where you kind of get this image of uh, was it, is it Civil War? I may, I may be wrong on that. You get the image of like. Wanda, she's sitting on the floor and she's crossing blocks and her psychic powers come into place and, and, you know, telekinesis, you know, these blocks to make a really bone crunching sound or whatnot. And they all kind of seem like a little bit crazy. Then they kind of made them seem like they're more stable than they are. I'm like, okay, like, like, that's fine. But where are you going to go from here? So I'm excited. I'm excited. Um, I don't know. I I actually don't know if it's going to make for a good TV show. I'll be honest. Like I, I think that I think you're gonna have a lot of stuff that's like, okay, what's the whole point of this? Because it's like this weird bubble, like this weird bubble that everybody kind of like, like is like in on it. It's it's right. it's odd. It's like a, like a fifty sitcom vibe, but I don't know. It's it's definitely one of those things that um, I'm interested to see the concept, but this is uh, it's strictly only setting up something. Right. But everybody has to realize that this is the story in between the story, which then people would say, well, what's the point of this? Couldn't we just get this in like a flashback or a movie or whatnot? Eh. Shelling something out and giving and, and giving uh, uh, Elizabeth Olsen her due to finally like, to finally not have to play off of somebody and be like that secondary character and instead just say, this is me. I'm taking a big role to this. You know, that, that, that's kind of a, a big thing there. You can't see in the background uh, on your screen, but uh, that may or may not have been the CEO. That was CEO. Look. <laughs> coming in and coming out uh, there. Um, but, yeah, that, that's pretty much all the movie news we got. Um, um, uh, in, in regards to WandaVision, though, I will say this. I, I'll say that while I, I am looking forward to the show, and now that we have a trailer now, I'm really looking forward to it now. Um, out of all the MCU shows that we knew we were going to get, my main excitement level was going to be for um, Falcon and Winter Soldier. But we, but we now know that's not coming until, you know, top of 2021. And so I'm curious, definitely curious. I, I'm more so curious if, if it'll hold my attention. For you know, because obviously it's, it's going to come out after Mandalorian season two uh, premieres. So, are they? What I'm curious, uh, I I think Disney is going to do what they did with Mandalorian season one, which is, you know, they release each episode every single week. Um, I don't know if that is a good thing for this uh, for this particular series because I feel like it's kind of okay just to binge through it, just to say that you binge through it. Mm-hmm. Um, I do I have a concern? Yeah. Um I feel like I I I don't think this is going to be like this groundbreaking kind of series, but I do think it can really hit a little bit on that like 
mental aspect of the show, uh, mental aspect and where Wanda's mind's going to be at come, you know, Doctor Strange 2, which this is all setting up. Um, my one concern is Marvel's gone down the TV route before. Outside of Daredevil and outside of most of season one, <laughs> most of season one of Luke Cage and uh, season one and season two of Jessica Jones, um, or really just season one and Jessica Jones, most of the most of the Marvel TV shows haven't exactly been stellar. So I need to make sure that this investment that they're going into to kind of do the transition thing, if they're going to be serious about it, then a couple of seasons is fine. This is a TV series that really feels like, in my eyes, I almost feel like this TV series needs to be no longer than four to six episodes. I have a feeling. What more? What do you? What do you really need? You get the well, state. You get the state of mind of Wanda. You get the big thing that breaks her mind, and then you get the aftermath of it leading up into Doctor Strange. And at the end of at the end of that last episode, you tell me the exact release date of Doctor Strange. Boom! There you go. That's true. That's yeah. true. I, I won't. I won't. Go, I won't go against that at all. Because well, most, I, I guess we, we we gotta see what we have to see where we go. Honestly. Right. Because most of these Marvel TV shows, it was one thing I always told my friends. I said they're every single one of them, including the seasons I actually liked. They're three episodes too long. It's like that's three extra hours I have to watch. That I get the point. Like like you're not you're not adding new stuff for me into this. If you make it ten episodes, it's great. With this series. I don't need 10 episodes. Right. Perfectly fine. What was Mandalorian? Mandalorian was uh, six to eight episodes, right? Seven is like that. Okay, perfect. Do the same thing with WandaVision. You do the right. same thing with WandaVision, you're probably going to get a lot of people coming around to it and liking it a lot more than, say, 13 episodes of Iron Fist. Uh, let's get into a quick review of a movie that we talked about before we uh, we uh, started recording today. Um, you asked about this movie, and I'm uh, I'm more than happy to give you a brief review about it. And this uh, the Netflix movie is called The Devil All the Time. Um, now this stars uh, a movie that you think has uh, Spider Man and uh, Batman in it, and uh, Bucky Barnes is in it. You know, this should be a, a safe and good time. It's not. It's uh, it's 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 one of those. I hear it's uncomfortable. Very, very uncomfortable because because what it is, it's a movie that deals with religion oh. through the eyes of a small town, Ohio town. Oh. Right? And these are these are people who have either A, never left this town, or B, are so, how can I put this, are so wrapped up in their own sense of, of, of thinking that doesn't stretch past this town, they're just 100% set in their own ways. Now, the acting is great, Tom Holland is great, uh, Robert Pattinson is great. Uh, the movie gets really fucking uncomfortable. It really, it really does, um, and it's really kind of based around religion, and, and that's what's religion, Christianity, and and how how um, definitely uh, certain things like uh, the sins of the father trickles down to the son, and is it's, it's incredibly made. It's made so good. However, there are scenes in the movie that will leave you uncomfortable to say the least for sure for sure for sure but it's a great movie though check it out uh devil all the time it's on netflix right now um do you have, um, a, do you have a score for it um one i only watched it once i don't think i need to do this movie again so i think for that one time run i'm gonna give it a solid great acting really uncomfortable story i'll give it a seven and a half out of ten very cool very cool definitely so, today's super throwback September movie is, mind you, 
Dave was was cool enough to let us do Lowdown Dirty Shame last week, knowing he hated it. This one is choice of Dave's. However, I did not hate this movie. Good. That's why is I want to hear. <laughs> is it odd? Hell yeah. But, you know, I didn't hate it. We are taking it back to 1986 with The Hitcher. Original release date, February 21st of 1986. 34 years old. Mm -hmm. Insane. Shares open the weekend with parting glances and nine and a half weeks. Um, production budget, $5.8 million with a box office total of $7.9 million. Uh, currently holding a 61% on Rotten Tomatoes. So, Dave, this is the movie that you chose. Is that fair? Yeah. I, I, I think the highest I'd probably give this movie is is maybe a 70. Mm -hmm. um, only because uh, this movie is 97 minutes long, and sometimes it still feels like it's about 10 minutes too long, <laughs> I guess you could say. Um, because the movie starts out so, so, so fast and hard and it's like the tension is creeped up within the first 15 minutes the tension is really really creeped up high and then it and then it decides to pull itself back when it pulls itself back it's not that it necessarily gets worse it's that it, it's starting to kind of throw like the uh uh the the uh, it's starting to kind of throw out that like art house horror and that's one of the things I, I actually really enjoy about this movie. This movie was like the prelude to those art house horror movies that like, you know, um, you know what I mean by that, right? Where it's yeah. like, it, it's not, because in the 80s, you're so used to slasher flicks, right? Because that was it. It was the birth of the flasher, uh, flasher flick, uh, the slasher flicks. Um, and, you know, it, it's supposed to have like grotesque sex in it and stuff like that. This movie pulled away from all of that and instead was like okay we're going to take an actor who's considered a list at this point and who was pigeonholed at this point um to romantic uh to romantic comedies i don't know if you knew that like, right oh, at that point in his career going into this movie was known for uh blade runner which which hey, what are you doing? Sorry. Yo! Oh, Let's see, let's see you again. <laughs> um, Rutger Hauer at this point was pigeonholed into being a uh, romantic comedy mm -hmm. um, because he had only been known really at that point uh, for Blade Runner and Blade Runner wasn't well liked when it first came out. It got, it, it, it became more of a hit, you know, towards the, towards the later 80s and, and early 90s into the cult classic it is now. But at that time, like in like in his career, he was known for stuff like Eureka. He was known for like a breed of parts. Um, he was known for uh, Lady Hawk, you know, which are all fine movies. You know, they're 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 fine, but they're not memorable. Although I know I know Lady Hawk pretty well. I actually really enjoy that movie. So for him to come into this role and just and just like level up everything with this is what really makes this like, like uh, I want to say my favorite horror movie because there there's definitely more that uh, that I like better, um, but it definitely like it stood out for me more than because think about it like at that time like New Line had like like think of what all these other companies were coming out with uh, 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 during that time like this is 1986 so you had. New Line had, uh, um, oh God, why well, can't I think of the name of uh, 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 it? was a movie, isn't it? Um, Paramount had Jason, New Line had Freddy, Universal had Norman Bates and Chucky, plus all of the Halloween sequels were like happening right at this time. So it's like at this point, you know, these all these movies like turn big profits, but you know, they, they're, not, they're not gaining like a lot of respect for the kind of movies they are. I mean, think about it, like, Jason is iconic, but can you really, really, like, if I was to, if I was to pinpoint a death for you, you know, could you really tell the difference between one Jason movie versus the other? None. Probably not, you know? No. Same thing with Freddy. The only difference is, is that I do think the first Nightmare on Elm Street is a different ball game, like, because Johnny Depp threw the bed spewing out 
you know, that is fantastic. With this movie, it's like, fuck all that. Like, like, no, this is, this is, we're making this movie and then this movie only. Technically, there's a sequel to this movie. I've never seen it. Like, that sequel happened in, like, 2000, whatever. I've never seen it. And then there was a remake of it, and the remake sucked. By mm-hmm. it. What are your thoughts going into this movie when I, when I, when I selected it? Like, have you, had you ever seen it before uh, when I suggested it? I had seen the, the, the remake with Sean Bean. Um, okay. I was always aware of it. I've never seen it. <clears throat> um, Rutger Hauer... God bless the dead. Rutger Howard, to me, no matter what I see him in, has always been a creepy dude. You know what I mean? Like, like you, this is news to me by, by you saying that, you know, he, he was doing rom-coms. Like, whoo, Rutger Howard. Because he was, he was a naturally charming guy. Like, have you noted... Have you noticed how, like, kind of, like, subtly charming he kind of gets throughout this film? Like, it's like, like, you think of, think of the 80s mindset. Think of white people 80s mindset at that time. They're overly trusting, you know? So it's like, yeah, no, I'm going to help out this guy. No problem. Um, he was always, like, a really charming guy. But go ahead. Sorry. But, but when this movie opens, mind you, my... <laughs> <clears throat> my initial thought of Rutger Howard immediately goes to Blade Runner, which is weird in that too. Sure. But but when this movie begins and you know see Thomas Howell, he picks his dude up, and it's, it gets so cr- it gets so weird the first five minutes in. It's like what the hell, you know? Yeah. And it just jumps off so quickly, right? Now uh, for me, um. The first time I watched the movie was today. It was the very first time I watched this movie was today. And I I couldn't turn away because I was just like, this is getting crazy. This is getting weird. You know what I'm saying? But the fact is, like you, I, I guess uh, the one problem I do have with this movie is the fact that it is 97 minutes long. However, because it starts off so fast-paced and it's, it, it's, just, it's going, and it becomes this weird halt. But it's not really a halt. It was kind of just coasting it's, along, so to speak. You catch your breath. Yeah. But it's, like, but it's like by the time you're finished catching your breath, you're ready for more, and it didn't take off again. Like, not really take off, I guess. Right. Like, it would. It does. And there's a terrifying scene in this movie that I still think is like, is like finally a horror movie that's willing to take the chance you know, that you don't, I don't want to say you don't see nowadays. It's just, you know, you don't see it nowadays. You know what I mean? And, I, and honestly, honestly, I, I, I couldn't call this movie. It's not a horror, this, this movie's not a horror movie. No, it's a, it's a, it's a road thriller. The it's road a thriller. thriller. Because there's no slashers, <laughs> none of that shit. But it's more like the, the, the situations that the dude finds himself in because of John Ryder, it's like, all right, this is, it's creepy, but it's not a horror flick. For right. example, when he's, when he's eating um, the, the piece of uh, some chicken or some shit, and then the, the, uh, the finger, I was like, oh, holy shit. <laughs> now, now, I, I want to let you in on, uh, I want to let you in on something. For a good while in this movie, because remember, like, the whole the whole reason why he even found Rutger Hauer in the first place was because he was getting sleep deprived, was that he was getting tired on the road. So the question immediately came to my mind when I rewatched it again was, it was because nobody had interacted with Rutger Hauer outside of him. I said, what if he was really the guy that was doing all this? Of course, it didn't go down that route, it went a totally different route, but like, you know, the little coincidences that you were kind of seeing, and it's like, wait a minute, like, like, is this really trying to set up to where he's actually the killer this whole time, you know, and, and he's just... I, trying- I felt that way. I felt the way about a lot of scenes, because especially when we live to that last scene, it's, it's like, okay, wait a second, whoa, 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 
is are they gonna make C. Thomas Howell the killer now? Like it, it was kind of weird, and and it's funny because the way we the way we're talking about this movie, it doesn't necessarily require us to go like scene by scene, no. but it's more so of it's it's, it's it's filled with moments that are otherwise, if not eerie, uncomfortable. Absolutely, it is so uncomfortable. Um, um, uh, uh, another scene that that, that 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 tripped me out was the um, was the uh, the bus scene. Uh, uh, he, he gets oh, on the God. bus. <laughs> no, no, no. Prior to that, prior to that, prior to that, the scene where he's at the diner with with, with John Ryder, and that scene is so uncomfortable because he says, "You didn't shoot the bullets in that gun." He took the bullets from the gun. <laughs> Bro, I was. Dude, I, I thought I was, I was going to bug out. All right, so um, let's get into this movie real quick. This movie really kicks off. It's, it's late in the evening, clearly in Death Valley. I am sorry. That is Death Valley. I know no, no. they spent that at Death Valley. I was like, dude, Zigzag's Road is like right around the corner from where you, from where you guys This is miles up the road. Easy, easily. But they're trying to make this uh, make it seem like that we have this uh, we have the main character C. Thomas Howell, uh, who also was at that point kind of a teenage heartthrob. You know, you had him in like Grandview, USA. You had him in um, Soul Man. Soul Man. You had him in uh, The Outsiders. E. T. was his first ever role. Red Dawn. Um, so these were all these were all kind of movies that that you know you're getting like this little teenage heart uh, heartthrob crush. So for him to come in and 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 kind of start off a little weird, it's it's almost an underrated performance by him. And here's why. Uh, I don't know if I can say underrated, but I, 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 think. I think I think it is, and I'll I'll tell you why. When the movie first starts and he goes and you're clearly seeing that he's like been driving a long time because he nearly, he nearly runs into a semi, right? right. So he goes off the road and he sees a hitchhiker and his thinking is actually not that bad of thinking for those who travel alone and you're driving long ways. I know this because I've had family members who were truck drivers. You know, sometimes you need somebody just to yap in your ear. Right. So you're 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 focusing and, and talking to somebody else. So he picks up Rutger Hauer. It is pouring down rain uh, at this point when Hauer comes in, and you're you're noticing that Hauer is incredibly standoffish, like like not. I don't want to say not appreciative at all. He's just like almost exasperated at first. And then standoffish because he's avoiding the simple question, where can I take you? Where can I take you? Where can I take you? You know, and he introduces himself as John Ryder. And as kind of the weirdness, as kind of the weirdness of the situation starts, because because Howell, again, is, isn't really measuring up, uh, measuring up him up. Howell goes, pulls off to the side of the road and says, no, you need to get out of my car. Your ride is over. And he's like, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you where I'm going. Just drop me off at the next gas station. I need to get gas for my car. And you see a Volkswagen, a white Volkswagen, uh, a beetle pulled off to the side of the road. And, uh, when it looks like, ew, when it looks like how was going to pull off to the side to check out what's going on, Rutger slams his hand into his knee Pushing on the accelerator and driving past and driving past he's, uh, driving past the beetle, and that's when Rutger kind of lets him know what's going on. He goes, uh, he goes. He probably doesn't have much to say because I cut off both of his legs and his arm. And it's like, dude, what the fuck? Like, how are you just like like? And Howl is like petrified but weirded out because is he bullshitting him or is he not? I felt the same way. <clears throat> I, I, felt, I felt the exact same way leading up to when he pulls out the knife. Now, that's a great – I'll tell you why that's a great scene. That's all improv. When he put, pushes that knife against his face, that look you're getting from C. Thomas Howell, that's genuine fear. He oh, yeah, is I know. I know. for his life at that point because, because 
power is so intense in that role that you're 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 stunned. Go ahead. Um, when he has him repeat, I want to die. Number one, John Ryder immediately comes off as he's homicidal, but then somewhere along the line he becomes both homicidal and suicidal. Of course. Like, he'll take himself out in a heartbeat. What do you want? I want you, I want you to stop me. And he, he like, said it so fast, you can't really hear what he said. And then he finally, like, kicks back up. He's like, I want you to stop me. Right. Like, at that point, at that point, it's a homicide. You're right. It's homicidal and suicidal at the same time. He want to know how long he can get away with this crap. Exactly. Um... Oh man! Oh, uh, they get pulled off. They get pulled off to the side at a at a roadblock checkpoint, which is again weird because I know this is Death Valley, and so I know the only place that could have possibly had that happen at was maybe Yermo at that time. But even or, or if not Yermo, then maybe Baker ish. Maybe Baker. It looks more like a Baker spot, right? So they get pulled off to the side. And, uh, and, and the guy asking about uh, Illinois, where are you coming from, from Illinois? And, you know, he says, from Chicago. And the guy responds with Rockford. And, uh, and there's suddenly, like, this kind of, like, I don't want to say a gay scene, but, but, clearly, but clearly, like, the guy kind of gets turned off to the scene because he sees Howard's, like, hand on the inside kneecap of Howell. And you see him kind of turn it in. And i got to be honest – I'd probably be a little freaked out too if I just like immediately if I immediately saw that, um, and they continue and they continue driving on. Howard at this point looks like he's he's going in for the kill. Like he just he's like you know what this cat and mouse thing. I caught this guy. There's nothing this guy can do. Needless to say, when his his door is slightly ajar and he doesn't realize that he doesn't have a seatbelt on. So Howell finally pulls the first non-silly move he's made in the, in the film and kick him directly out of his car. Straight out the car. Straight out the car. And he thinks that it's over. Now, keep in mind, for our viewers, I, I, for our viewers who are watching this episode, keep in mind, there's no cell phones. There's no – the only places that you can really go to, to have a – to even call somebody uh, in regards to this. By the way, they're supposedly driving through Texas, which I can kind of understand because Texas is, I'll tell you why. Because if you've ever driven through Texas, it takes forever for, to get from one gas station to another. It's like you're driving for 17 hours and there's just nothing there, especially if you're in Northern Texas. Sure. So, right. So when he finally uh, when he finally goes in, and the first thing he sees is is this other vehicle that's kind of you know pulled off to the side of, uh, of of the road and or not not really pulled off to his side but you know he's he's you know like trying to like figure out what the fuck has happened to him during that entire time and he goes and he goes and tries to pass this other vehicle but he notices um oh i'm sorry no what wound up happening was that he kind of pulls off to the side and a, bu- and a bus nearly hits him. And the reason why is because he thought he saw something in the back of his vehicle. When he looks in the back of the vehicle, Howard is in the back of the vehicle with his arms wrapped around these kids. It's and it's so creepy, dude. Oh, it's so creepy, right? It's so creepy, bro. <laughs> because now he has this knowledge of Howard, you know, of Ryder, you know, basically trying to kill him. So what's he going to do? So what's he going to do here? So he goes and he tries to warn uh, warn the other couple. And I mean, Howard is doing the classic 1980s stuff, which is you know like kiss the child on the forehead, you know, which which that that was always kind of an 80s thing. That's it's probably, effective. It's effective. Yeah, and it's effective. It, it certainly is. Um, and he gets pulled off. He gets pulled off to his side because he nearly gets hit by the bus. When he comes up to the vehicle, the vehicle's all bloodied up and he just he doesn't know what to expect and this is where this is kind of where that idea of that of that you know horror movie versus thriller comes into play because they could have shown the bodies but i 
also feel like I, I feel like it would have made less of an impact in that scene if they showed the bodies because there were there was I think I think there was at least three people in that car, maybe even four, with Howard in the back with Howard in the backseat as well. And you know, C. Thomas how he he plays it off so well. He goes and he looks and he's distraught, goes running back, and you just see him like throw up and barf, and it looks so gross and but real at the same time. Like it, it actually looked like he actually did throw up in there. That's why it's so effective. Most of this movie, the reason why this movie is so is so effective in my eyes, it's it is because it's taking nothing that nothing that's really like stretching the mind. You know what I mean? Like if you think about it, this is pretty simplistic. There's nothing like it's not Freddy, where Freddy can only get you in his dreams. It's not Jason, you know, a chainsaw wielding hockey guy, you know, chasing you around, you know, whatever. Or it's not Halloween is probably a little bit closer because there's nothing super natural that happens in the first one, at least. It's this idea of going on a road trip and you trying to be a nice guy and suddenly you made the wrong decision at that point. Yeah, well, uh, the, the, the very first thing I noticed about this movie, in between the, the, the kills <laughs> that, that, that do take place in the movie, it's really like a psychological breakdown of Howell's character because he's losing it. He's definitely losing it. He's like, they're blaming me for these deaths. I know I didn't do it, but at, at, even when I try to run away, this fucking guy's always catching up with me. Right. Right? For example, the next scene is when he goes into the gas station and he first tries to use the phone. And talk about, once again, that tension kicking up. Once again. It's like, it's like, you know, he goes and he tries to use the phone. Phone's not working. It's a dead gas station, right? So right. he goes back out to his car, and Ryder is standing right there in front of him. You know? Yeah. And he's like, holy fuck. <laughs> There's nowhere for you to go. And all he does is simply toss his keys right to him, gives him a smirk, and goes to call over another, uh, another hitchhiker. You mm -hmm. know? And of, course he gets, and, of course, he gets picked up. You know, which is a little, I know that's a little superseding, but it, it's, it's, it's not too hard to believe. Like at that point in, in history, everything, everything was there. Um, once Ryder leaves with his trucker, Jim encounters him again at another gas station. And this time, knowing that Ryder has taken over this guy's truck, uh, blows up the gas station, by crashing into the pumps. And I mean, like, the car is on fire when, when, uh, when, uh, uh, you know, when Jim, when Jim Halsey is, uh, is driving off of here. Right. Finally, this movie decides to calm down. Everything I just said is within the first 20 minutes of this film. Right. Not even. It finally decides to slow down. And uh, at a roadside di diner, Jim meets Nash, who's played by Jennifer Jason Leigh. And Nash is the kind of girl that she kind of has that that you know, she, it, it's a it's a low it's a low town feel where it's like I'm just here to kind of work you know whatever. The diner's probably all, all, where I'm always going to be for the rest of my life, you know, and um, and you know that's just where I'm going to be. And she goes and decides after having a nice little conversation, she notices that Halsey once again is kind of like spacing out over his food, you know, and she's like, she's like, oh, no, it's okay. I'll go and uh, I'll, I, I, got, I got some things to unpack in the back anyway. And this is what, this is what I really love about this scene because as he does, he, he does the space out, but he kind of like stares. At, uh, I'm going to be staring at whatever he's staring at. But as he's eating the food, like I said, as, as he's eating the food and looking, he takes a bite, which we know is food. But then his very next pickup is definitely a finger. Right. Not a, like, not he's a finger. Staring off. He's huh? still staring off at that point. He's still staring off, but, but you know for a fact what he's about to eat is a finger. Right. And so it was like, oh, this fucking guy won't let up. He won't leave me alone at all. You know what I mean? So it, it's, it's, it's one of those scenes where I genuinely felt the level of uncomfortable. Yeah. 
Because at, at, at that point, you don't exactly know, like, because you're sitting there and you're thinking, when did the finger get there? Right. You know? Or, once again, was this Halsey who actually killed a guy, you know, and kept his finger and then took it out at some point while eating his food, keeping it as a keepsake? At that point, the police, because he had called the police during that time, the police come over and they arrest Jim, saying that half the state has been looking for him for all the crimes that, uh, that uh, he's committed, as Ryder has framed Jim for his murders. Mm -hmm. And the police are quickly that fool in this movie. I'm just going to be honest. Like, like I, I get, I get the idea that they're trying to do, but, but it, it was also like, how often are you guys going to supersede belief with this? Because they get, uh, because they get Jim, they arrest Jim. Jim is then thrown in jail after like a phone call thing, and. And as he's saying that, as he's sitting there in jail, he goes and leans on the cage, and all of a sudden the door just cracks itself a little bit open, and Jim's just like freaking the fuck out. Like this isn't supposed to be happening. Like why is this happening to him? So of course he goes and he checks, and everybody's got their throat slit. You know, everybody's got their throat slit, and they show all the bodies. Oh, the dogs. The, the, the dogs are in there. The, you're right, right. Uh, everybody's throat, throat is slit except for the German shepherd that they had. Mm -hmm. And the German shepherd goes and he starts licking off the blood off of one of the guys. I'm just like, at this point, yeah, there's, I, I'm, I'm freaked the fuck out if I'm, right. I'm Jim, right? He finds one of the revolvers. Of course, police are coming in one way. Jim escapes from, from a back door. And uh, he once again, he, he, he once again, uh, uh, or in this case, he decides to run off through the desert where the police don't know where, where he is. Right. He comes up to a highway. In this case, he decides to go uh, across the street where um, <clears throat> he decides to go acro uh, across the street and at a gas station, he sees two officers, takes them hostage now, and he, and he requests to speak to Captain Estridge, who's the officer in charge of the manhunt for Jim. And he convinces, uh, and as Estridge convinces Jim to surrender, Ryder pulls up and he shoots the two cops. Man, listen, you, the way you just said it, that does not give that scene justice because as Jim is on the radio with the, I'm going to assume the, the, the captain or whatever, he or the sheriff or whatever, He's on the phone with, with them. And then in the brief in the background, you see the truck hauling ass toward the, the, the car. I'm like, oh, shit. Yo, 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 man. And then the camera pans right to Ryder. And, uh, and Ryder's like, got the gun black. I mean, it's the craziest scene ever to me. I, I'm like, what more can you do? Then just kill your fucking self, man. Like, this is crazy. Right, which is exactly what happens because a patrol car crashes, Ryder disappears, and Jim actually contemplates suicide because he's like, what the fuck do I have to do to, to avoid all this? Right. So then once again, he arrives back at the diner, and this time at, and this time at the diner, um, uh, this time at the diner, he gets a booth, uh, the tables are open, and uh, as he's kind of kind of sitting there and having his hands to his face, Ryder once again pulls up, and this time just sits right across uh, right across the uh, the diner with him. And it's, it's like a great scene, by the way. Oh, it's a great scene because again the tension is rolled up. You're just like you're like, what the fuck does this guy want? You know, and. But even but 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 even as subtle as that scene actually is, it's like when he's go, go you know, take this scene. Go Jim tell Jim tells Ryder, "I will blow you away," completely unbeknownst to him that there's no bullets in that gun. Right now, Ryder, from the view below the table, is kind of doing the the finger gun thing, finger gun. and he bumps the table, and I jumped. I jumped. <laughs> yeah, because he does this. He goes. 
he, he pulls the finger and goes, you know, and you hear it, and you're just like, what the fuck? Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Leaves him with the bullets and takes off again, right? So when the, so as he gets onto the bus, um, I, I, assume, I, I assume it's some sort of a tour bus or whatever. Um, well, it, it would actually be uh, during that time they they used to just have they used to just have these but because that diner is similar to how like Peggy's diner is outside of Barstow. Uh -huh. or it's kind, of, it's uh -huh. kind of just outside of town, and so the idea of the diner itself would just be that people kind of work there. And the bus would come and 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 you know take him back. You know, it's it's not a difficult concept. Go ahead. Right. Um, so he goes to he, he gets on the bus and uh he he goes to the bathroom on the bus, loads the gun. Um at this point, uh Nash appears on the bus, right? Snatches up Nash, puts the puts in the bathroom with him, say Nash up and puts the gun to her face. To her face. I am not a killer. Yeah, good, very ready to confess me you're not a killer. <laughs> Push the gun to her face and say, I, I didn't do this. Um, this guy's following me. I can't shake him, whatever, whatever. And as the bus takes off, and, and the crazy thing was like, for this to be 1986, these cops are on it as far as like where to find this cat. You know what I'm saying? Because as the bus is going and they're sitting down now, you know, and she's asking him, well, well what are you going to do? He goes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to surrender. I didn't do anything, but I'm going to surrender. Now the cops have not caught up to the bus, right? Have the bus pull over, make him get off the bus, throws off the piece. Uh, but the scene that got crazy for me was well, the same scene, but when the cop goes, uh, you spit on my wrist, come clean it up. I was like, hmm, interesting. And as I'm thinking like, yeah, this, this is it for him. Now he's get the bus and off the shots, right? and made the cops rid of their guns, they take the cop car, and they are driving to, I forgot what city they said they're going to drive to, to turn themselves in. Now becomes this wild police chase. And for this to be 1986, this is a wild fucking police chase. That is. I mean, there are guns blazing, Barney Fife's, that, that guns. Out, hanging out outside the window. I mean, this is Barney Fife seems like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So they're the shooting. Or taking shots at the car. Yes, like, they're... straight up taking shots at the car. You now, know? I hated Nash for a brief moment because she refused to shoot back. She shoots one shot back, and it drops the gun. Right. I'm like, Nash, what the fuck? Right. It, yeah, I, I'll, I'll give you that. But, uh... As they as it flees, they 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 disarm these officers in the process. They they basically do some fancy driving. The officers are disarmed. They go over a hill where a helicopter, a helicopter out of no oh god, where a helicopter all of a sudden just like goes right above them, and now the helicopter is chasing them. And this is about an hour and five or six minutes into this movie. Once again. Nobody else has interacted with Ryder at this point. Everybody has interacted with, uh, with Jim Halsey, right? Um, even when Ryder shot the two cops, you could make the argument, you know, that, uh, that Jim's gun had two bullets in him and decided, to shoot, uh, and decided to shoot the officers anyway, right? And then that's when you finally see it. You see the truck off to the side, and Ryder, is, and Ryder is sitting there in his truck, and he goes and he starts taking shots at the helicopter. Except this time, Nash has now seen Ryder. So now everything that is confirmed that, yes, there was another person, there is actually a dude chasing Jim Halsey this entire time, you know. Stalking him. This crazy-ass 24 hours, basically, you know, or 48 hours or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, is basically is basically going on because now he had somebody else to confirm that he's there, and he shoots down the helicopter and he shoots it down pretty clean with a revolver. Okay, maybe maybe that's a little super. Uh, maybe that's a little bit supernatural. Ooh, I know. Magic. I, I, I'm not I'm not going to deny that, but if they can have the Joker in 1989 pull out this long cannon of a gun and shoot down the Batwing with one shot, 
I'm okay with a couple of shots from a revolver shooting down a police helicopter. That was, that was flying low. Right. Of course, as the police chase him, Ryder joins the chase, murders the officers by causing a mass uh, car accident. They abandon the police car and hike to a motel. And Jim now, at this point, has cut. Jim, at this point, is kind of sick of every everybody's shit a little bit, and he just kind of wants this entire nightmare to end, right? right. But he hasn't, he hasn't taken that leap of, he hasn't taken that maturity moment, I guess you can call it. Like, it's not that he's necessarily being immature, it's that he, he hasn't been, he hasn't been confronted with the man up, you know, moment, at least not yet. In the, mot- in the motel, um, Nash tries to call her father, and he tells her, please don't do that. Like, you got to understand, I don't know where this guy is. He can ch- turn up at any time, right? Jim goes in and decides to take a shower. And in this case, a- and now Nash decides to call the father, kind of let him know what's going on. And what comes in is the most creepy. It's <laughs> so fucking creepy. So oh, damn creepy, dude. Hey, which is again the way that this is shot is strange because I want you to consider everything. The door leading outside is to the left of the bed. So you have the door, then you have the bed, right? You have the shower that's that's across from the bed towards the back. You also have where uh, back back in the eighties they used to, used to be able to turn on the radio with a button from. Uh, 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 from the hotels, and I, and I knew that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ryder is in the room at this point, and Ryder decides to stand himself not next to the bed, but diagonally to the bed, where he's just watching her. So that means he had to enter in the room, turn, and then look. Instead of just, like, being there and then just, like, staring off from the side, he literally took a couple of steps and almost dared himself to be caught at that point. When he realized he wasn't, he then lays down next to Nash and puts his arm around Nash, and Nash kind of gives, like, a little smile. A little comfort smile, yeah. Comfort smile, like, like finally, I'm getting some fucking action here. I'm in, I'm in Texas. And he doesn't necessarily do anything. I mean, that's creepy enough. That's bad enough. Um... Nash finally goes and looks over because the hand that, he's, that she's feeling doesn't feel right. Looks back, it's Ryder, and he and he and he cups her mouth before she can uh, before she can scream. Jim obviously recognizes something is wrong. Shortly, pulls the towel bar off the wall and tries to go back and, and check out what's going. Uh, check out. Oh, wow. the, oh, this next scene is eerie. Okay. Now. As as Jim decides to start searching this motel slash, it's a trucker park is what it really is. Right. He goes and he's looking through the truck park where fi- where finally Captain Estridge, who you've been here uh, who you've been hearing about, who's played by Jeffrey Demun, by the way, a very young Jeffrey Demun, very young Jeffrey Demun. What's up? Um, goes and uh, and finally captures him. They kind of hold him down. And, Real quick, but, call me crazy, but every time I see Jeffrey DeMond in anything, I, I mean, it did back to him in, in the Green Mile when he, like, pulls the uh, the uh, the holes on, on Billy the Kid, piss on me, you son of a bitch. I love that fucking scene. <laughs> it's a great it is, scene. It is a great scene. They capture Jim, and they decide to say, he only wants to talk to you. He only wants to talk to you. And, and you're trying to figure out what's going on when you see it. Nash is tied up, gagged in the mouth. Her legs are tied to the end of the truck, having one driver, and her other, and her arms are tied up to another truck that's not moving. She's about to be pulled in half. Mm. And Jim goes and he enters the cab with Ryder who gives him the revolver and tells him to shoot. Tells him to shoot because 
that's what he was wanting this whole time. He wanted somebody to stop him at all costs. And Jim responds back somewhat petrified. And he says, but she'll die. Which is true. She will die. Which is true. And Ryder goes, and he, 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 he has like this look of disappointment almost. Like, goes, picks up the revolver, puts the clutch into gear, and lets the truck go. For the and life of me, I'm so glad we don't actually see that. Nash dies. Do you understand how hard it is for an 80s action movie to have the main girl die? Mm-hmm. Like that. I just die ripped in half. Yeah. I'm not talking a gunshot. I'm not talking a stab wound. I'm talking ripped in half. Now, you don't see it, but you hear it. Oh. And you're just, you're devastated because as Nash is kind of like this small town girl, you kind of grow to like her. Like, Damn. She helps him out and, and, and you know, just leaves him now and realizes, like, like this fucking guy's insane. He's yeah. in, you know, and, and, and is probably scared, you know, and, and, and you're kind of rooting for, for them to kind of make it work. And for that to just have it, your heart just sinks. And the tone of this movie, within the last 20 minutes, changes dramatically. Because even Jim in the cab was like, you know they'll catch you. You know they'll catch you, and 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 Ryder just goes and he chuckles and he's like, "So, it's like what? Yeah, like you're just." And really, it, it was because of that exact line after he. Well, correction before he kills Nash in the soul line, and then obviously when when, when I see blacks out, knowing Nash is now dead, and and Ryder's now in custody. I'm like, there's still a solid thirteen minutes left in this movie. I'm like, there's no way Ryder walks away from this. No, of course. But there's also a super strong chance Ryder pulls a fast one and, and gets out of it. And it's, it's left to Jim to take him out, which right. is what he wanted to begin with. Right. Mm-hmm. The Ryder is then taken into custody, and Astridge gives Jim a ride. Um, and, and, and Astridge decides to give Jim, Jim a ride. And you know, they, they, of course, the prosecutors try to talk to Ryder. Ryder's not giving them name. He doesn't even give his name. You know, when they ask where he's from, he's like Disneyland. And they have that lawyer, uh, uh, Armin Shimmerman. He, uh, um, he's been on a couple of things. The one thing that I immediately think of him on is, uh, is um, uh, Principal Snyder on, on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He's also he's also the voice of a couple of people. He's also uh, um, he he also plays Quark in in uh, in one of the Star Treks. Uh, I think only the movie though. Um, First generation or next generation, was it? Something like that. I think it was Insurrection. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know he you know of course disbelief, and they decide to go, which is a weird protocol, of course, to have C. Thomas Howell, of course, talk to him. And he goes and he shakes his hand, and all he does is spit in his face. <sighs> right in his face. Like, like it was loogie too. Like, like, rah, like, like it was just like all over, you know. And Ryder goes and kind of cleans himself off. Kind of, like, but he kind of like plays with it though. It's because a, a little bit. It's gross. So, so of course, uh, uh, Estridge is giving him a ride. Uh, he doesn't believe that police can hold Ryder, which we all kind of know at this point. Right. They can't hold Ryder. They right. have to do what's necessary. Right. And and he he's surrounded by what, like seven guards? Like like, like seven cops? It's something like that. It's it's yeah. a higher number than you would expect for one transport. For one dude, yeah. And and you know, for for I felt Jim on this. When he's riding with uh Estridge, he knows for a fact, like you're not going to keep him. And He's going to get out. You see it in his face. Which you, is see, you can feel it. Which right? is why I'm kind of giving C. Thomas Howell a little bit of that underratedness. Because he's getting up to that moment finally in this film. Which is kind of what you're hoping for. Go ahead. So he pulls the gun from Estridge. 
Uh, he took the pull over and he goes, well, you know, son, you, if you don't die, you're going to get in big trouble, yada, yada. He said, I got to do this. I'm like, okay, okay. Turns out he, he lets Edge out the car, drives back to where the, uh, the, the escort is. By that time, Ryder to took up the whole fucking bus. That had a shotgun, had a shotgun in his hand. Boom, boom opens the back of the bus where he sees Howell in the police car and jumps, fucking jumps. Did you hear, did you hear the sound in the back when he jumps from the bus to the truck? It was like a lion roar. Yeah. Yeah. That shit is creepy, bro. (laughs) Bro, that is so damn creepy, bro. And then once he's in the, once he's in the truck, he goes, Hey, kid. But no, you got to die. Bro, you got to die. I'm sorry. You must die. Mind you. Mind you. I, I, I want P, I'm, we're, I'm not necessarily doing this justice. He jumps and lands on the hood and crashes through the windshield. He's all cut up from the glass. Hey, kid. What? You got to die, man. You got to die. You, you, I mean that. Does it affect you? You just, you don't know how fast the vehicles are going, of course, but man. Like, like, it's just, it's, it, it's insane. So a, 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 a scuffle ensues. Ryder now knows he has to kill Howell because he can see it. Um, Jim slams on his brick, slams on his brakes and sends Ryder through the windshield and onto the road. And Ryder just like a baller just stands up. He's up. I'm like, stands up. Run and- him the fuck over. Challenge Jim to run him over. Right, which because at this point, so he he throws him off, but the 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 cab had died in the process, and he's cranking it. He's on the floor of the of the cop car trying to crank the car, mm-hmm. no pro- uh, with 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 no issue. Ryder is pumping the shotgun into uh into the cab when finally it, it clicks and turns over, and he go and 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 how and Halsey goes, and he just hits the gas and goes and uh and riders challenging him to hit him which of course he does mm-hmm. as jim leaves to observe rider's body of course rider jumps up because nothing's going to kill this guy and jim uh, and jim decides to finally grab the shotgun and just start pumping into his chest like three in his chest shotgun. and finally at least you believe rider is dead and the ending shot to this film is just Jim leaning over Estridge's car and begins a cigarette. and just smokes a cigarette as the sun begins to set. It's a it's kind of a badass ending almost because it's like I don't really need to know what happens to Jim afterwards because you know what happened to Jim. Like mm-hmm. like he, he he's exhausted uh, from this whole thing, and it it's one of those films that. You you sit there and, and you think about all the intensity and the emotions of it, and I remember Ebert. You know, he wrote a review and he and he just wasn't convinced because he's like, it's boring. He, he actually gave this a zero a zero percent. What uh, he did? It was one of his first zeros that he ever gave for for uh, for a movie because he wasn't convinced by by the motive of Rutger Hauer. Mm-hmm. And my whole thing on it is that it's not about necessarily a motive in this. It's that if anything, Rutger Hauer would be that personification of just pure evil, of just I'm an evil person, and this is what I want. This is what this I is want. What I, this is exactly what I want. I'm I want you to. Yeah. You. I am daring you to stop me. I'm daring you to uh, to kill me. Do you have the guts to do so? Because I'm coming to kill you. And the thing about it is that that's really creepy about the whole situation. It literally starts from a thumb out hitchhiking. It could be anybody. Exactly. Anybody could have, could have. It's like, it, it, it reminds you of a collateral for a movie like present day movies. Yeah. Collateral, it could have been anybody. Right. You're just, all, all you're doing is just picking up the dude. Yeah. You're just picking up the dude. You don't know who the dude is. 
you're just trying to be cool. You're trying to be a nice person. You think you're doing, you think you're doing a, good, uh, a nice thing. I'm going to tell you a true story um, real quick. This, uh, this did not happen to me. It happened to my father. Hmm. My father was, uh, uh, my father was TDY to New Orleans and uh, decided to drive it out from Atlanta to New Orleans. And in the process, he decided to pick up a hitchhiker because that drive to New Orleans is minimum, minimum 17 hours or something like that, right? So he figured it's probably bad because he had to be reported in within two days anyway. So he wanted to get in early. He actually picked up, picked up a hitchhiker. About an hour into the drive itself, the hitchhiker, he actually picked up two hitchhikers. Uh, uh, about an hour into uh, picking up the second hitchhiker, that hitchhiker decides to pull a knife on my dad. Like straight up pull up a switchblade similar to how the hitcher is and pull a knife up on, on my dad and, uh, and start threatening both the guys. And they finally pull into like a gas station, you know, where my dad, where my dad, who's a pretty, my dad can be a pretty smooth talker and can kind of ease tensions pretty easily. Mm -hmm. uh, was basically able to get this guy separated from the two of them. And they basically booked it and they left him at the gas station there. They didn't even call the cops or anything like that, you know, but that's what I'm talking about. Like this is, this movie doesn't really suspend belief too much. Like, yeah, okay, maybe there's a supernatural aspect in terms of how the fuck is Ryder always there all the time. But then, True. but then, but then, uh, you have to think, well, was it Jim Halsey this entire time? And was he just sleep deprived so much that this happened? And again, if this movie is, if this movie is remade in the 2020s, I look at, a, I look at a film like Invisible Woman and maybe they explore that a little bit deeper than how this movie really did. But it's a fact that it's a fact that it's a possibility in this film until an hour and six minutes into this film, that you're not convinced that hasn't happened. Once once it's confirmed, the rest of the film just goes downhill. I don't want to say it goes downhill. It just it it, it leads up very quickly to its conclusion. Right. You know, it's just it it just has a really really fascinating idea with this. Um, yeah. Yo, I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. I'm, gl I'm really glad you did. I, I was thoroughly enjoyed this movie um, because it's one of those situations where it's like. It just reminds you I would never pick up a hitchhiker ever in life. Right. Walk, damn it. <laughs> like, you can picture this movie easily being remade in the uber fashion, right? Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Like, and especially because you hear. There was a story, I'm not kidding, I think there was a story today in Las Vegas um, where, where an uber driver literally held up a couple at knife point and hogtied them in their vehicle, um, and hogtied them. So that's why I'm saying it's not hard to suspend belief with this. Maybe it's it's why it's so fascinating for me because yeah, this is all shit that can really happen. I'm, this is all that's where that's where it really gets genuine fear for me. It's like yeah, man, like you know, there's people out there that'd be willing to do this shit. Oh you yeah, know there is. All right, uh, Let's do some, uh, do, do, do some takeaways, man, before we get to our quick hits. Uh, who gave you that guy award? Uh, it is going to be Rutger Howard, easily. This movie can does not work without Howard's performance. If, if Howard at any point seems silly or not serious or committed to this role, this movie, this movie I wouldn't have selected this movie. But because mm -hmm. Howard just, just brings that intensity quickly into this film... You know, you, you, you have, I have appreciation for, for people who decide to really try to, who really try to up roles a lot. Like Sam Elliott is a perfect example. Sam Elliott is so comfortable to look at, you know, and so comfortable to watch that when you see him in a movie, that when you see him in a movie, like A Star is Born, and you're sitting there and you're like, how the fuck did he not get, get the award for this? Because he brought such a he brought it to the next level Howard has always done that throughout his career it's just i also feel like he was born at the wrong time at the time there was a big action movie stars when he was coming up that didn't happen until you know 
Schwarzenegger and Stallone and all those guys. But then at that point, it was all cheesy writing anyway. Right. Howard took it seriously when it needed to be serious. Uh, that chick award. There's only one chick in this movie. But let's be fair. It's not like it's a bad decision to pick Nash in this movie. Nash at first kind of plays that, you know, hometown girl, you know, thinking, oh, okay, you know, whatever. She's just going to be there. But, bro, like, she – when she got her moment to, like, really kick it up a notch, she did. And and she – and, you know, she kind of play she, – she kind of tugs at your heartstrings a little bit, especially – especially when you find out what happens to her. That full work. Probably all the cops. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really say there, there's – I can't really say there's any one particular cop because I feel like the cops were just there to be more of a nuisance more than anything. They weren't, it, it, it's not like, okay, like Viva Vendetta is the example I'm going to use here. The cop that's in that film is actually trying to like figure out what the fuck is going on. None of these guys are interested in that. They're just interested in catching the bad guy right. and they constantly get the bad guy wrong and they wind up losing a lot of cops in the process. Oh, yeah. They're lemmings. They're turning lemmings in, into this. Um, cut that out. I can't really say there's a lot that I'd cut out. Um, there's maybe a couple of scenes that I would shorten, but, ha- but it'd have to have the same impact that, that, that it does. Because sometimes when this movie gets too quiet, it leaves you feeling like you're wanting more in those scenes. Like, it needs, it needs a little bit... I don't know, some some music to kick it up a little bit or something to keep you engaged in the scene. Cause otherwise it just you're just like, okay, now what? I agree to an extent, but I, I also say this sometimes silence is golden. <clears throat> sometimes silence can be golden because you you don't know how to feel, but you gotta feel something. Right. And and I'm not I I, I agree. I definitely agree that that sometimes movies that play music and you know what i'm probably wrong on that thinking of of having you know music play but in that case i would focus it in just maybe a, 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 i turn it up to i turn it up to a higher level on some of those scenes where it's just a little bit more focused a little bit more you know um and then you could properly feel it does it hold up i think so I also think that, you know, look, this is a 34-year-old movie, you know, so for me to say that holds up after 34 years is great. Um, I could easily see this movie uh, honestly uh, honestly getting a remake in the true fashion that, the, that a remake is supposed to feel, um, which I think they've done a couple of times. I immediately think of, like, the movie Wrong Turn, you know, which – was pretty underrated about guy uh, about you know a group of teenagers being being you know uh, pursued by a truck driver. You know, you take that away and put Rutger Hauer in that role, and that's it's the same thing. Um, so yeah, so I think I think it definitely holds up. I don't want to say that it's going to hold up forever, um, but I feel like I feel like with the right moviegoer, people are still going to find something to take away from this film. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, uh, and uh, I kind of see. Think the iconic scene in this film is unfortunately, uh, uh, is unfortunately the scene with with Nash in between the two caps because it's the first real time that that you know you didn't feel like the hero was going to get it. You know, you know, there's the, the, the truck scene is the signature moment of this movie. It's, it's the, it's the timestamp. It's a, Hey, you know, this is, this is kind of the whole point, you know, getting to this point of this film. There are, there is definitely a more underrated scene. The, 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 the car chase scene is very underrated in my eyes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Considering the time, but it, it's got to be the truck scene. It's it's a signature moment for a movie where you don't and you don't really think about that with horror movies like like and and again I'm using horror movie. I know we agree that's kind of a road thriller, but think about that when a horror movie actually has a, an actual uh, 
a signature moment, it immediately reflects, it reflects on your mind. Uh, paranormal activity, the first one, has a signature moment at the very, very, very end. When that body comes flying back into that camera, you are fucking petrified at that point. There was already a lot of scary moments in that, but when that body comes flying back, I let out, I let out a small, whew, one of those, you know. That's because it was so impactful, and yes. that's what, and that's what that scene is. It's impactful. It 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 made a fucking difference for for the movie because you're like. It, because immediately when he thought that, oh, okay, he's going to go into the cab and then whatever, you know, oh, and they're going to save Nash. But when they didn't, you're it, like, changed, it changed the perspective of the movie itself. Like, it, oh, it you it's, have to die. You're just like, okay, he's really got to go now because right. now you actually killed somebody I cared about. Right. So, so yeah, so that's the uh, uh, iconic or signature moment for myself in this movie. Yeah, uh, yeah. Andrew, that guy award. Uh, a lot, uh, honestly, a, a lot of it is gonna be uh, the same as you, but we, we I'll run the mine real quick. I, uh, that guy is easily John Ryder. I mean, if you don't already view Riker Howard as a creep show, I don't know what else can convince you that this fucking guy is nuts. And um, and, and we'll, we'll talk about it during quick hits as well. But there's no way I could be on set. As this dude is in this mode, because he was because he was an actor that really gave it one hundred and ten percent. He did. So oftentimes when he's in this weird killer mentality, like Dude, you're fucking odd, bro. I, I I can't be around you. You know what I mean? But he played he played it he played it to his strengths and did a damn good job with it. So yeah, John Ryder. Uh, that chick award, which obviously there's only one. Nash, because it's the same, same reason why you said. Uh, you do feel for her at the end. Unfortunately, she doesn't make it in the end, but uh, oh, uh, otherwise, a strong character. Somebody that, that that was definitely somebody that you rooted for. You kind of root for them together and uh, for, for the end way it does, like, huh, I was really looking forward to that. You know what I'm saying? But Right. Another thing on, on uh, Nash, and, and uh, she doesn't get a whole lot of respect, especially when you consider, like, like the upcoming, you know, movies that would wind up coming out. You know, a lot of people, like, consider, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis, you know, the queen, the scream queen, obviously, which is per- perfectly fine. Um, but there was something to really appreciate about Nash, and just she felt very real to me. Like, this was, like, this, there, there was nothing fake in my eyes about it. I don't know about maybe her shooting at the cops, but I could agree that if she did shoot at the cops. She's not shooting repeatedly at the cops. She's maybe shooting one shot to get him off and the drop the gun. So and that felt real to me. I was like, that's a very real moment. Yeah. So uh, I agree with you. Uh, uh, that full award. Every single cop in this movie. It, 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 it just is. They're, they're expendable to me. They are. They're, you're only there to get picked off. They rent the cops. Oh. Yeah, you're you're only there to get picked up. However, one you don't one of the officers' names until you get to the captain. <laughs> yes, but one cop in particular was the, the one cop that talked about spin on my wrist, clean it up. Do you have no idea what's getting ready to happen? But it is what it is. So yeah, the cops. Uh, cut that out. Uh, I'm with you. Uh, I I wouldn't cut anything out. I would more so tighten up certain scenes mm-hmm. that kind of you know it was the 80s so a, a lot of scenes kind of kind of play out a bit too long and that's kind of when that 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 97 minutes kind of feel like it's longer than that um but it, it's all co- cohesive to the story so i couldn't cut anything out so maybe i would say tighten up a lot <laughs> um does it hold up you know be my first time seeing it i'm gonna say yeah uh i was i watched it and i was genuinely like i am Disturbed watching this shit, so I can say, "Yeah, I guess it does." All right. I'm glad. I'm glad you said that. And finally, iconic scene. Iconic scene. I was gonna go with you as far as the Nash ties to the truck, but it has to be the diner scene. It has to be the scene uh, when diner scenes are good. Diner scenes are really good. Ryder comes in, sits down with uh, with Jim, and I'm telling you, when he bumps the table, I jumped. <laughs> No bullshit. I jumped. I'm like, okay, <laughs> this is crazy. 
this is crazy. Yeah, that, that's definitely my iconic scene. It, it just, it, 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 it sticks with you because now you're almost in the mindset of where Jim is because Jim is fucking scared. But you're also in a position where, like, I have no idea how to end this. God, this is why, this is why it hurt me last year when he died. Because for me, power to me was always, yeah, okay, he was an A-lister back in the 80s, but, you know, he kind of became more of a B-lister actor, mm -hmm. which, I'm, which I'm fine with. But he still brought it. Like, even watching, like, Hobo with a Shotgun, which, yeah, I make fun of that movie pretty often. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> I make fun of that movie. But it wasn't like he shied away from, from, from the roles at all. I felt like he was always a pretty committed actor. You know, it wasn't, I, I never felt like he, he turned in a role and you're just like, or at least a role I never saw him in. Even when he played the bad guy in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you know, the movie. You know, That's comedy with that. And he still yeah, pulled it off. Yeah, straight comedy with it. He was still kind of taking that serious role with it. And right. I liked it. Keep in mind, his sidekick was Pee Wee Herman. Yep. <laughs> All right, quick hits. I got mine loaded up. Um, first quick hit for me. C. Right. Thomas Howe admitted that he was actually afraid of Rutger Hauer on and off the set because of Hauer's general intensity. I feel you, dog. I yeah, feel you. Definitely. Uh, Rutger Hauer did a lot of the stunt driving throughout the film, which amazed the crew and even the real stunt drivers. All right. Uh, while performing the last bit of the windshield stunt, Rutger Howard knocked out one of his teeth with the shotgun he held in his hands. <laughs> in Rutger Howard's book, All Those Moments, uh, Howard mentioned how, to, how executive producer Edward S. Feldman settled on Sam Elliott for the role of John Ryder. Howard states that apparently Elliott was so scary when he came into audition that Feldman was afraid to go out to his car afterwards. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> had a scheduling conflict and had to back out of the role. That's amazing because Elliot always feel, felt kind of warm for me. Like, mm -hmm. he's kind of a warm guy. Yeah. But to, to hear that is pretty amazing. Go ahead. Uh, let me see. Uh, but, 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 see Thomas Howe's fear when Rucker Howard was holding the knife near his eye was genuine. Howard improvised the line and the position of the knife. Um, writer, producer, and director Christopher Nolan has listed this as one of his favorite films. I see why. Um, and uh, I'll get uh, my last one. Uh, Entertainment Weekly ranks this as the 19th scariest movie of all time. That's a pretty good one to, uh, to end on. Uh, my final one... I'll see if there's a final one. No, I'm good. I'm good with yours. I'm I'm good with any on yours. Yeah. Well, uh, I think the moral of the story of today is uh, don't pick up nobody. Just ride, take your road trip. Don't pick up nobody. You never quite know when that. Uh, it don't even matter if you meet these people on Craigslist. Don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, <laughs> damn good. Damn good pick for uh, a super throwback September. We have one more left before before we wrap up this uh, this month. We do. Uh, I think we do. Do we? No. Uh, you sure about that? Or, 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 or just the last one? Uh, let me check the schedule. Technically, this is the last one. Technically, this is the last one. Shit. Because we uh, we, we we hop on uh, uh, a couple of uh, strong strong Octobers. Yeah, we hop on that October trip, which I'm. Well, uh, for this to be the, for this to be the last for Super Throwback September, uh, obviously not the last we're gonna do it, but for us to close out Super Throwback September on this movie, damn good pick. So kudos to you, Dave. Where can they find you? Uh, you can always find me on Instagram, uh, Facebook, and Twitter at David Andrew Neff. I'm the co-host here at Back to the Classics, and also uh, and also host. Uh, the fireside chats that we do every Sunday. Um, those are specifically more, uh, more philosophical, more than anything else. Um, kind of a reflection uh, on the previous week and how to take your attitude to uh, next week. Considering that 
this year hasn't exactly been the kindest to everybody, uh, especially the now 200,000 deaths in the United States of COVID-19, um, including, I don't know if you caught this, but uh, uh, a major celebrity just passed away uh, uh, from it. Um, God, what's the name? I just saw it too. I'll recircle back uh, with it, but it was, um, but a major celebrity passed away uh, uh, from COVID-19. So the whole point of the fireside chat is to kind of, kind of give a, a very, very quick five to seven minute little talk uh, on, um, on everything, uh, on everything that that's kind of been, you know, focusing uh, for everybody. So, Please go ahead and check it out. It's only on Instagram. I'm not going to post it to Facebook because I just I feel like we already throw so much shit on Facebook, and uh, you know I kind of want this more for a broader crowd um, instead of you know my own personal friends to question me on this. <laughs> um, but that is on our official IG page, BTTC Podcast. Make sure you go ahead and check it out. Um, other than that, uh, go Lakers. You know. That, that's about all I can really say. I don't really want to talk about my Falcons. We don't talk about the Falcons. Falcons are fucking garbage. Yeah. We, we know. yeah. Uh, oh, go Raiders. You know, what go was, Raiders. Absolutely. That was, that, go Raiders. What was that? That was awesome. Yeah, absolutely. That was a lot of fun to watch last night. Um, so, yeah, um, that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, my guy, Jay Lonzo, where can they find you? All social media is uh, at official Jay Lonzo on IG, Jay Lonzo on Facebook. And of course, official Jay Alonzo on Twitter. Uh, like Dave said, the uh, Instagram page at BTTC Podcast, where you do get your links to Fireside Chats with Dave, featuring me on occasion. Um, uh, I did a, a special guest spot on um, my guy Kenyon Long's podcast, Internet People Podcast. Check that out; it's available now. Uh, I actually, shared it to the Facebook uh, Facebook group page. Jump on that, check that out. Very very funny episode. Um, of course, uh, with that being said, the Bachelor Class and Movie Talk page and Movie Talk group on Facebook, jump on those. Those are always fun to be a part of. Uh, with that being said, I, I think we got all that out. Oh, don't forget FOH every Sunday. Uh, I was just on that last week as well. I got kicked out by third round. It's all good. And um, stop, stop having shitty food opinions. It's my palate. Fuck out of here. <laughs> Anyway, with that being said, uh, it's always fun to chop it up with, with, with you center folks out there. Thank you guys for rocking with us for so long. Uh, thank you for um, uh, uh, rocking with us for, for Super Throwback September. Uh, and we'll be back next week with a whole nother goodness, goodness, goodness. With that being said, this is Back to Classics. We'll see you next week. I am Jay Alonzo. And with me, of course, is... Andrew Neff. We will see you good folks next week. Peace.